Well, good morning. Thank you all for being here. I'm Michael Strain, Director of Economic Policy Studies here at AEI. Why has the economic recovery since the end of the Great Recession been unusually weak? And why do many economists believe we are in for a period of sustained weakness in the rate of growth of GDP? Has demand been weaker because of deleveraging? Has growth been weaker because of the severity of the recession and because it was accompanied by a financial crisis? Are we about to enter a period of sustained slowdown in the rate of useful and transformative technological change? Are we stuck in a liquidity trap? Has economic policy, including the policies of the Obama administration and the Fed, acted as a drag on growth? Are we in a period of secular stagnation, an important hypothesis advanced and brought into the mainstream of the policy debate by Dr. Summers? And as importantly as diagnosing the underlying problem, how should policy respond to slow growth? To discuss this issue, and uh, I imagine to discuss other issues as well, AEI is honored to have two giants of macroeconomics joining us today. Lawrence H. Summers is Charles W. Eliot University professor at Harvard. He was the 71st Secretary of the Treasury, and during the Obama administration, he served as director of the National Economic Council. He was previously chief economist of the World Bank. Robert Barrow is the inaugural John H. Macon Visiting Scholar at the American Enterprise Institute for the current academic year, and we're really honored uh, by that. Dr. Barrow is Warburg Professor of Economics at Harvard. He was a viewpoint columnist for Business Week and a contributing editor of the Wall Street Journal. Their discussion today will be moderated by Greg Ipp, who is one of the top economics journalists in the world. Mr. Ipp is Chief Economics Commentator at the Wall Street Journal where he writes the Capital Account column. He was previously U.S. Economics Editor for The Economist magazine. Uh, the format of, of today's event will be very straightforward. We'll have some brief introductory remarks by Dr. Barrow, some brief introductory remarks by Dr. Summers, and then we'll dive into a discussion. We'll have some time at the end for audience questions. And to those of you who are watching the live stream, I think you can through technology, send, send questions to an iPad somewhere up on the stage, and so please uh, feel free to do that as well. Thank you very much. So Robert, I guess, uh, thanks very much, and I guess we'll start with a few comments, and Robert, I guess you can go ahead. Okay, I wanted to say a few things about the topics that Michael just uh, mentioned. Um, so I think it's generally accepted that there's been no recovery with respect to GDP growth in the U.S. and many other economies since the end of the Great Recession, uh, 2009. Um, in order to recover, you have to grow for some period at above the average rate, and that's not what happened over this period. Um, in terms of getting evidence about re what recoveries typically look like, I've relied mostly on the kind of uh, research I've done uh, with other people on uh, the sort of largest depression events that one has seen in history, uh, sometimes called rare macroeconomic uh, disasters, and coupled that with an analysis of the recoveries that followed on these extreme disaster events. And the evidence from that is that recoveries typically uh, recoup about half on average of what was lost during the prior downturn. And that corresponds to somewhat above normal growth for some period, and it tends to be a fairly rapid recovery to the extent that uh, uh, it occurs. So there's been the contention that we haven't had a recovery in the U.S. since 2009 because of the severity of the Great Recession. I think that basically gets the sign wrong. I think the evidence is that the stronger the downturn, the stronger the recovery. Uh, I think it's also wrong to talk about the financial crisis as the reason we didn't have a strong recovery. Uh, in history, most of the uh, non-war uh, depressions have involved financial crises, and nevertheless, you see this pattern about recoveries that I uh, just referred to. The Great Depression itself is an example of that, because in the U.S. there was a downturn, 1929 to 33. It's a fall by about 29 percent in per capita GDP, and that's followed by growth at an average rate of 6.5 percent per year from 1933 to 40, which is a very strong uh, uh, recovery despite the severe financial crisis. Um, the big surprise, and a surprise to me, uh, of the recent period without the GDP recovery is that the labor market has actually been pretty strong. Uh, 
Uh, so payroll employment growth since the trough in 2010 has actually grown at almost 2% per year, uh, which is a pretty good performance. So the labor market looks pretty good, and the declining unemployment rate uh, kind of reinforces that uh, picture. So the combination of things in the recent period is weak GDP growth combined with pretty good labor market performance. And of course, that has to be mirrored in weak growth of labor productivity. Uh, and in fact, the growth rate of labor productivity is pr close to zero since 2010 in the U.S. Um, the slowdown is obvious if you look since 2010. It may have, it may have started earlier, like 2004, 2005. Uh, but me, to think about uh, the weak recovery, uh, I focus on what is it that influences productivity, uh, labor productivity. And I naturally think of uh, forces that are sometimes labeled as supply-side influences when I think about that. I have a tough time telling a Keynesian aggregate demand story if I'm trying to focus on what is it that enhances productivity growth. Uh, so examples of forces that are good for uh, economic growth and productivity growth, I really get more from the empirical growth literature rather than from thinking about uh, business cycles. Uh, so the kinds of things that are good for growth are uh, strong rule of law and property rights, uh, free trade, uh, lack of inefficient regulations, some kind of public infrastructure to the extent that it actually enhances productivity can be good, uh, good institutions for education and health, uh, fiscal discipline and efficient taxation. A lot of these things work through encouraging investment, which can in, in turn enhance labor productivity. Now, if you look at what was actually done in terms of policies fo uh, following the Great Recession, that is, uh, from 2009 on, uh, the biggest thing in the U.S. was a dramatic increase in transfer payments to persons. Um, so that total at the federal level went up by three percentage points from 2007 to 2010, from about 9 to about 12 percent of GDP. And following that, there was a small decline through 2015. Uh, so if you look at the components, uh, unemployment insurance initially went up dramatically and then fell dramatically, particularly when the uh, extended federal benefits were uh, eliminated. eliminated. Uh, other parts have stayed permanently elevated. So that includes Social Security, especially disability part, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, food stamps. So all of those programs look like they've had a permanent increase in relation to GDP. Uh, in, uh, in terms of the reaction to the Great uh, Recession. Um, one can argue about uh, whether uh, larger transfer payments are a good idea, but I don't think they're very likely to raise productivity. And again, I thought labor productivity was the key matter to be considering. Uh, the other main policy coming from the government is dramatic monetary expansion. And we can again argue about whether that's a good or bad idea. I don't think it's something that's going to be center stage if you're thinking about productivity enhancement. Uh, so there's a question, what is it that explains the productivity slowdown? This is subject to a lot of controversy and interesting ideas. Uh, some promising possibilities are uh, growth of inefficient regulation, uh, decay of public infrastructure, a slowdown in the rate of technological progress, uh, other factors that have reduced uh, the investment GDP ratio. Um, fiscal uncertainty, those are all things that have been raised as possibly important, and I don't know how to uh, pick the, what's most important. Uh, the really pleasant explanation that has been raised is measurement error, that GDP growth is understated because we don't uh, have a proper adjustment for new goods and quality change, and iPhone is often raised as an example of that. Uh, so if that were the answer, that would be terrific. We wouldn't have to worry about the productivity slowdown. We wouldn't need any special uh, policies. Um, in this context, the uh, recent discussions in the ongoing uh, campaign are pretty depressing because to the extent that they talk about economics, it focuses on things like trade and immigration restrictions, higher minimum wages. Uh, I don't think any of these things are good for productivity, so I think they're irrelevant from the standpoint of thinking about economic recovery and growth. Um, on the other hand, lest I be too pessimistic, I thought the Simpson-Bowles uh, uh, commission report in 2010 was excellent, uh, particularly looking at the long-term pattern with respect to taxation and entitlement expenditure. Uh, it's too bad it was basically ignored. If we could get back to that kind of thing, I think one might have more faith in uh, 
terms of Washington policymaking. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, Larry, a few remarks. So a fair amount of what Robert says uh, that uh, I agree with. Uh, recovery has been very slow since uh, the trough of uh, the recession. The economy is 12 odd percent below where you would have predicted on the basis of a trend run through 2007. Or to put the point differently, if you looked at GDP from 1929 to 1940, and the best estimate of GDP from 2008 to 2019, on a basis per member of the adult working age population, those two figures will have been about the same. That is to say, over the 11 year period of the Depression, and over the 11 year period that we've just been through, GDP has behaved about the same. Obviously, it was much more V-shaped during the Depression than it has been uh, during the current episode, going <coughs> down further and coming up, but ending in just about uh, the same place. Robert is right that uh, if you attempt to decompose that slowdown into employment and uh, productivity, it is much more on the productivity side than it is on uh, the employment side. Robert places no emphasis on uh, the role of uh, demand uh, in all of this. I do think we have had substantial issues of demand management. There are substantial issues in the world economy of demand management. And there may be substantial issues in prospect in the United States of uh, demand management. The best single way to measure inflation expectations, in my view, is by comparing the yield on 10-year nominal securities with the yield on indexed bonds. If you make that comparison and you make an adjustment for the fact that uh, the index bond uses the consumer price index and the Fed targets a different price index, the so-called deflator for personal consumption, you get an expectation in the United States that inflation will be below 1.5% for the next 10 years having fallen short of the 2% target over uh, the last seven years. At the same time, the index bond yield is telling you that real interest rates, which probably have something to do with the supply and demand for capital, are at extraordinarily low levels, suggesting in the United States and to even a larger extent for the industrial world as a whole, an excess of saving over investment, which is significantly uh, constraining uh, the level of demand, and has, in my view, contributed to the relatively weak economic growth over the last uh, seven years, and leaves us with a very serious prospective problem that historically, with 20% probability, economies go into recession in any given year. And the normal way of responding to that is for the Fed to cut interest rates by 500 basis points. And there's likely to be a recession long before there's anything like room for the Fed to cut interest rates by 500 basis points. So I think that without denying that there are very large challenges on the productivity side, that there are also substantial issues on the demand side as reflected in what's happening uh, to uh, nominal GDP. What is to be done? It seems to me that it is not hugely plausible to argue that the United States has had a major deterioration in its legal institutions over the last eight to 10 years. It seems to me that the argument
that somehow this has been a period of crushing and unprecedented burdens on uh, business uh, from regulation does need to confront the observations that corporate profits as a share of income are at near record highs and the related observation that the stock market has tripled during the period when it was thought uh, that these burdens uh, were imposed. But it seems to me that the logic from both the supply side and the demand side points to the promotion of investment in both the public and the private sector as central priorities uh, going uh, forward. I would just emphasize that it seems bizarre that at a moment when borrowing costs have never been lower, materials costs are very low, 15% of men between the ages of 25 and 54 are not working, that the nation has its lowest rate of infrastructure investment in uh, two generations measured relative uh, to GDP. And so it seems to me enormously in our interest to increase the quantity of infrastructure investment and at the same time to engage in a set of reforms <coughs> directed at improving the project selection, the uh, efficiency of uh, procurement, and the streamlining and execution of uh, those uh, infrastructure investments. It also seems to me that there is uh, a case, even without believing that uh, regulation is central to understanding the productivity uh, slowdown, to looking at what can be done to encourage increased private uh, investment. And there I would cite uh, as a priority uh, corporate tax reform. And uh, perhaps you'll indulge me in an analogy I've used before. Imagine that you were running a library. You might decide that it was a good idea to give an amnesty so that people who had overdue books would bring them back quickly. You might decide that that was a bad idea and so you should tell people you'll never have an amnesty and they'd better bring back their books because otherwise the fines will accumulate. But only a fool would put a sign on the library door saying no amnesty now, but we're thinking of one next month. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Now think about a nation whose corporations have two and a half trillion dollars of cash abroad and who have to pay taxes at a 35% rate to bring that cash back into the United States, who tell those corporations there's no amnesty now, but we're having a tax reform debate and we might have one next year. It's hard to imagine a better capital repulsion strategy uh, than that. And so surely bringing clarity to the corporate tax reform debate and resolution, from my perspective, best done through a significantly broader base, a significantly lower tax rate, neutral taxation between foreign uh, income and income repatriated, and greater international cooperation on various forms of profit shifting. But in some way, bringing clarity and resolution to the corporate tax reform debate seems to me the single most important thing we could do to uh, encourage uh, private uh, investment. I don't know what the answer, I agree with Robert on uh, the importance of uh, productivity. I focus on public and private investment because those are things that I'm pretty confident are important and I'm pretty confident we can affect. And there's a great deal in productivity where uh, the interconnections are uh, puzzling. I would, I would frame one aspect of his comments uh, slightly differently than he did, although I'm not 
I'd be surprised if he disagreed a lot. Um, and that is, I would say, I think the evidence is overwhelming that productivity is undercounted. Leave aside information, leave aside information technology and just think about statins or other pharmaceuticals that have huge impacts on life expectancy and where we reflect almost no uh, productivity improvement. But from the point of view of economic policy, it barely matters if, and most of the things we're discussing, it barely matters if productivity has been understated by a constant 1% or a constant 1.5% or 2%. The interesting question in terms of explaining the data would be if the magnitude of underestimate has increased. And there, I think a fair-minded person has to be much more agnostic uh, in assessing the data. But agnosticism about whether the underestimate has increased should not be confused with agnosticism about whether there is currently an underestimate. Um, terrific. Thanks very much. Uh, to all of those of you watching online, just a, a quick reminder. Um, you can actually submit questions, and we'd love to like hear from you. Uh, so just go online to sli.do and you enter the code AEI event. It's very easy. You enter your name and type in your question and submit it. And if you're lucky, uh, if you're lucky, I'll actually figure out how to use this technology. <laughs> and I'll get around to asking it. But in, uh, before that happens, I'm going to ask a few questions of my own, because I want to zero in, Robert, on a point that you made, which is incontrovertible, which is the productivity situation. I mean, if you go back uh, four or five years ago at the I, and what I think is interesting here is that this is not a purely United States phenomenon. It's actually a, a global phenomenon. Uh, four or five, when the IMF looked back at their forecasts, they found that their output forecasts for most of the uh, developed countries have systematically been uh, overestimated. Growth has been weaker. But their employment forecasts were systematically underestimated. So uh, if you look at a country like the UK, for example, which has basically outperformed every other OECD country on employment and underperformed on GDP. So we know that as an accounting matter, this tells us that productivity is a problem. What we don't know is why. And I think there's a healthy debate about whether it's a demand problem or a supply problem. By demand, I mean we know that capital investment has been very weak, and that arithmetically reduces labor productivity. But we also know that uh, efficiency, total factor productivity, began to slow before the recession. And that's more strong on the supply side. So I'd like to hear both of you weigh in on whether you think the productivity story is a demand problem or a supply problem. The pattern that you mentioned that makes me uh, de-emphasize the role of aggregate demand in the current uh, situation in the U.S. and elsewhere, because you have this pattern that you described where uh, GDP has been underperforming and the labor market is actually pretty good, including in employment growth. Uh, that's not the typical response of the economy you would get from uh, in a insufficient aggregate demand. You wouldn't get that behavior typically in the labor market, at least not in the models that I'm familiar with. I used to actually work in this area, but not so much uh, uh, recently. So that's the pattern that motivates me to think about uh, what matters for productivity. And that's where I end up emphasizing things that look like supply side policies, as you, as you described. So um, now it could be, of course, as you suggest, some of it can be working through investment. And there are some recent uh, papers that try to break out uh, the, the trend in labor productivity and how much of it is related to uh, reduced capital formation and other forces. And reduced capital formation seems to play some role, but not quantitatively that large. So I don't think it's the main part of the story. And then we're left with a lot of other things that have been proposed, some of which uh, Larry debunked, uh, that might uh, matter for productivity growth. Uh, I also agree completely with what he said about measurement error. Um, the case for the existence of measurement error is much stronger than the case that the measurement error problem has expanded. People who talk about the iPhone also claim that it's become much more of a serious issue than it used to be, but I'm kind of agnostic about whether that's true. I'm a little sensitive about what he mentioned about statins. <laughs> I've had this ongoing argument with my doctor about whether I should be taking a statin, and they have some stupid formula they use to, to determine whether you should take it or not, but the completely dominant factor in the formula, formula is how old you are. And if, <laughs> if you get beyond a certain age, it's always going to say, take it. And so now I was forced to do it, but I'm kind of irritated about that. Uh, Larry, what do you think? Demand or supply? What's, uh, why is productivity so weak? 
Afterwards, you're going to have to explain to me why the formula is stupid. <laughs> 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 seems kind of sensible. <laughs> seems seem kind of sensible to me. Look, uh, I think a, I've, I have written and what I've said about secular stagnation has more to do, has emphasized uh, the uh, demand side. Um, I don't want to be heard as suggesting that there isn't some mystery on the supply side uh, as well. I think there is a fair amount of evidence that uh, there is a kind of inverse Say's law that applies where lack of demand creates over time lack of supply. Uh, Robert is right that you can explain something but not everything and not most by looking at reductions in capital investment. I think it's more difficult to think about a range of things that firms may cut during recessions. R&D, development of uh, reorganizations and uh, the like that represent a kind of unmeasured investment and are sacrificed uh, during uh, periods of uh, investment, uh, during periods of downturn. So I think I would be a bit more inclined to attribute more of the productivity slow uh, shortfall to the consequences of the downturn on uh, the demand side than uh, Robert is. But I would agree with him that there is a puzzling uh, pattern of surprisingly weak productivity growth, which has odd, has odd concomitants. If I told you, just in the abstract, that productivity was going to slow down for an unexplained odd reason, that you didn't know what it was, I think you would be inclined to expect that what you would see at the same time would be some tendency towards higher prices as lower productivity growth reduced, uh, raised businesses' unit labor costs relative to the path you expected. And so you'd expect to see inflation surprising on the high side. And I think you might also expect to see profit margins squeezed a bit. And so there's something odd about a productivity slowdown that goes with disinflation and goes with a significant increase in uh, capital's uh, share. Those, the disinflation in particular leads me to think a little more about the demand side. After all, it's the oldest bit of economic reasoning that when the quantity of apples goes down and you're trying to figure out whether it's demand or supply, you look at what happens to the price. And if the quantity of apples goes down and the price of apples goes down, you tend to think that something's going on on the demand side rather than on, uh, the, su on uh, the supply side. And you also have uh, the puzzle of uh, rising uh, profitability. Two ideas that, are, that haven't been mentioned yet and are out there in the discussion that may be relevant to all of this, although I don't think the evidence is overwhelming, is well short of overwhelming on either, are the possibility that the level of monopoly power has increased uh, in uh, the economy, which would account for a rising profit share, would account for some inhibition in the willingness uh, to uh, invest and might, because of output restriction, contribute to, and reduction in competitive pressure, contribute to a slowdown uh, in uh, productivity. That's one hypothesis that I think is worth exploring. The other thing that I think is 
worth exploring for which there's substantial anecdotal evidence, um, including, I have to confess, from my own behavior, um, which is that one aspect of the internet is that people at work spend less time working and <laughs> more time uh, being uh, distracted. And if, in effect, we are now mismeasuring hours at work, because there are more hours at leisure that are called hours at work, it would tend to explain Robert's um, anomaly of um, employment, stro employment strong and um, productivity uh, weak. And there's, you know, people who, whatever one thinks about this, uh, the bits of anecdotal data from uh, people who, you know, monitor uh, during the day use of FaceTime and the like from employer domains, that type of information is fairly supportive of the hypothesis, of this, of this hypothesis. Mm. Um, so uh, I, I had- Can I pick up on one? Uh, sure. Larry's mentioned a couple times this uh, pattern where you see uh, low inflation, low real interest rates, uh, weak investment, in particular here, private investment. Um, my conjecture, I, I'm not certain about this, is that the common uh, source of all these things is the idea of elevated disaster risk, uh, and that that was particularly reinforced by the uh, Great Recession, 2008, 2009. Um, what that would do, of course, is dramatically lower the real rate on safe assets because there'd be this flight to quality kind of idea. Uh, it can explain maybe low inflation despite dramatic monetary expansion because of the willingness to hold uh, staggering quantities of safe assets, and particularly depository institutions holding remarkable amounts of excess reserves at the Federal Reserve. And of course, it would go along with weak investment. So even though the uh, cost of credit looks low in terms of real interest rates, uh, the underlying force, which is the higher disaster risk, would shift back investment demand. So my conjecture is that uh, this is a key element in this explanation, but I don't have this completely certain in my mind. I think the, look, all views have, all views have anomalies, so I don't want to be completely dismissive of uh, Robert's, uh, Robert, of, of Robert's view, but I think the, a difficulty with that line of thought, it seems to me, is the robustness of uh, the stock market and the fact that you have a fairly direct measure of this which is the price of out-of-the-money puts, um, which are exactly a direct insurance policy on these things. And it would be more like right to say that that price is abnormally low than it would be to say that that price is uh, abnormally high at uh, certain periods. And so I think I would be, what would convince me that you were right uh, would be some evidence that uh, the price of buying a security where you pay, essentially you can price the following on a financial market. Uh, I give you X today and you give me $1,000 if within the next three months the uh, Dow Jones average has fallen by more than 5,000 points or fallen by more than 30%. And it's my understanding that you could not make the case that there has been a dramatic increase uh, in that price. And certainly over the six years, six or seven years since 2009 and 2010, that price has dramatically declined. And that's why I think it's difficult to make that case as a store. I think it's particularly difficult to make that case in explaining anything that has changed between 2010 
in 2016. So, so well, I'm, I'm really sympathetic with that argument because actually I'm doing a lot of research exactly along the lines that Larry just sketched. And the price that he's talking about peaked dramatically in 2009. Uh, and then it is much lower now than it was then. It has, however, actually come back up a bit from, from where the bottom was in between there. But that force is exactly uh, why I, uh, hesitant about pushing I mean look Robert let's do it the other way if things were terrific if we'd had a terrific seven years you would be explaining that unlikely disasters looked phenomenally likely in 2009 and 2010 and that the broad trend was for it to be way down from 2009 and 2010 I'm really to I'm sympathetic with that actually okay. that's why I'm hesitating about okay. pushing this line that I think is the major uh, discrepancy is what you just highlighted but I want to uh, st stay on the supply demand issue for a little while though um, Robert you mentioned that you or your doctors insisted that just because of your age you take statins well the rest of us should be grateful <laughs> because it's kept you active and productive but that's not true for a lot of the world you know what I mean and, and I and one of the supply side factors that I think is really at work here is demographics you know what I mean in 2008, two really big things happened in this country. Lehman failed, and the first baby boomers started collecting Social Security. And this is another thing that you see across the entire world, so that it probably can explain the synchronized nature of the slowness of output demand, is that populations are aging everywhere. So you get declining labor force growth, and there are changes to the, you know, companies are probably less likely to invest if their customer base is shrinking over time and if their workforce is shrinking over time. Uh, Larry, I think you were, yesterday you were citing this uh, Fed working paper that suggests demographic factors can explain all of the decline in trend GDP growth and the trend neutral interest rate since 1980. It's, pretty, it's a pretty persuasive uh, little bit of evidence. And if that's right, is there really much that we can do as a policy matter to change that other than like go out and tell people to just have more children and wait for 30 years? <laughs> well, let me, let me just uh, clarify a clarify what, what the effects of demography are, and I think, I think the things I'm about to say, the things I'm about to say about policy, Robert will not, I suspect, not agree with, but I think he will agree with these analytical observations. So the first effect of demography is that if the population grows less rapidly, then the labor, the labor force grows less rapidly, and so output grows less rapidly. And there's an easy way to take account of that, which is to just look at per capita. Uh, per capita output, and I think Robert and I both did that in the statistics we cited, and productivity growth has been slower. The second observation is that the reason societies invest is in order to, is in significant part to provide capital for new workers and to provide housing for new families. And so if the growth rate of new workers and new families slows, then one would expect the share of GDP devoted to investment to uh, decline. And that has happened. And I think demography is a significant part of the reason uh, why. And that is, I think, a significant part of the explanation for why real interest rates are so low, and it's part of the reason why I think people who look at the interest rates and say they're extraordinarily low by historical standards, therefore policy is highly expansionary, are making a mistake because relative to the proper benchmark, policy is not so expansionary. However, I think that a substantial part of what we have been emphasizing in this panel is that productivity defined as output per bit of labor and capital has declined substantially. And there is no obvious and natural reason why productivity as defined by labor per unit of labor and capital should go down just because the labor force is growing less rapidly. And if anything, when the labor force grows less rapidly, you might expect some tendency towards increased capital intensity, which would lead to a higher growth rate in productivity. So I think invoking demography as an explanation for slow productivity growth actually is not a terribly plausible um, idea, at least from the point of view of economic theories. 
I do think we would be better off with more rapid GDP growth coming from a more rapid growth in uh, the effective uh, labor force. And I think there are things that can be done uh, that uh, affect that. Uh, I do uh, support um, more generous and expanded uh, family leave policies because I believe they are likely to raise labor force participation and that is likely to lead to more rapid growth uh, in uh, the labor force. And it seems to me there's a fairly clear market failure as to why the market will not in and of itself generate enough of that, which is that if I'm the employer who competes by offering the best family leave policy, I will be the employer who gets the most people who take advantage of my family leave uh, policy. And so therefore, everyone can benefit from everyone offering family leave, but any one firm who innovates is uh, strongly disincentivized. I also think uh, there is a quite strong case uh, for immigration reform, which done in reasonable ways would expand uh, the growth of uh, the uh, labor force, um, and uh, particularly if done in ways that affected high-skilled workers. Um, would I think have offer the prospect of entrepreneurship that would bring some increases in productivity. Robert, what do you think? <clears throat> I, I agree with your important observation that the productivity slowdown is something that's common across a group of countries. And that certainly pushes you in the direction of saying your explanations for this phenomenon should be something that works uh, in common across the countries rather than being uh, country specific. Uh, so one thing that pushes you toward is this view that technological progress uh, growth rate is uh, weaker than it had been. That's certainly something that affects the countries in common. Uh, I agree with Larry that the sort of tendency toward diminishing population growth is not a promising factor. In fact, it's well known that uh, diminishing fertility rates, which have been quite pronounced, are a source of positive per capita GDP growth, and that's very strongly confirmed empirically. Uh, it might be the case that uh, age structure going up and more retired people could be a drag, uh, although I've never been able to find the empirical evidence for that across countries. Uh, that part might maybe the fertility should go uh, the opposite direction. Uh, I wanted to say briefly something about public infrastructure investment, which Larry mentioned uh, before. Uh, I'm basically sympathetic to that if one can concentrate on things that really enhance productivity. Um, and in particular, if you want to do something like building a bridge or a highway, you have to think about what does that do to productivity. So you wouldn't focus on the sort of jobs program aspects of these projects. You wouldn't be focusing on the expenditure side, which would be a contributor to aggregate demand. You'd be focusing on the productivity enhancing effect after the infrastructure was in place. That's, that's when it would be expected to actually matter. Uh, so something that makes me skeptical about the potential for this is what I understand about the experience of Japan. I think they've had a tremendous increase in infrastructure investment over the last uh, couple of decades. And it certainly has not a helped economic performance, including uh, economic growth. And I was also told that uh, basically they've gone so far in terms of infrastructure investment that the marginal return is probably negative. So it's not a very good model for the U.S. to, to follow. Um, actually, I want to pick up on that, Larry, with you, because you've obviously been very emphatic that um, doing more public infrastructure investment is kind of a no-brainer. And I think it's actually an issue on which there isn't a lot of partisan uh, disagreement. I mean, both presidential candidates want to do more on the infrastructure. My question to you is, can it really move the needle, though, on the problems that we've been discussing here? You said that we're like 12% below trend GDP right now. You know, public infrastructure is, what, 2% of GDP or something like that? I mean, how much would you really have to spend to change that number? And then as a practical matter, you yourself have written about a bridge over the Charles River that's like years and hundreds of millions of dollars over budget. It's just very hard to do infrastructure um, efficiently and quickly. So what do you say to those two problems, that the magnitudes and the logistics are just very difficult to make this a practical solution to, this, to the stagnation that you've talked about? 
So first I would say there's a very substantial amount of maintenance investment that almost certainly has a high payoff. And I think that there is a tendency when people talk about infrastructure to envision mega projects of one kind or other, complex public-private partnerships and the like. And I think the evidence is most compelling on uh, the desirability of maintaining the infrastructure we have. Um, I agree with Robert. I don't think that it's either or between creating jobs and uh, raising demand and doing things that are efficient in terms of augmenting the economy's uh, capacity. I don't see why you have to choose between those two things. But I do agree completely that the right focus in choosing projects should be the ones uh, that will have economic benefits. And my read is that the highest payoff stuff, um, or much of the highest payoff stuff, uh, involves maintenance. Who knows whether their estimate is uh, precisely right, but the American Society of Civil Engineers estimates that uh, the average American pays the equivalent of a 75 cent a gallon gasoline tax in extra repairs on their car because of uh, unnecessary potholes in American uh, roads, uh, uh, in, uh, in American roads and, uh, and highways. I also think there's another argument that needs to be factored into the infrastructure discussion, particularly when you uh, talk, uh, particularly when you talk about maintenance, uh, and that is that we measure the national debt. We do not measure the national deferred maintenance liability. Both are burdens that this generation is placing on our children, and I would argue that at current interest rates, the cost of deferred maintenance compound substantially more rapidly than uh, the cost of paper debt. So even apart from any economic benefits in the form of higher GDP, simply doing the deferred maintenance uh, more promptly is a good thing. Is a reasonable program of infrastructure uh, investment going to be the silver bullet that uh, eliminates a 12% of GDP gap no. Um, I think it would be a very ambitious target for growth policy to raise the growth rate of the economy by 1% from its current level. And if you raise the growth rate of the economy by 1%, it would obviously take a substantial time uh, to uh, fill any gap. And I think infrastructure investment is best viewed as one important component of a program that might have uh, that aspiration. But I don't think there are silver bullets that all of a sudden add 12% to the GDP. So I think the right task is uh, to try to find uh, strategies and invest strategies that uh, will generate benefits and uh, increase the growth rate. I do think it's a little bit misleading also to frame the debate uh, entirely uh, in terms of uh, the GDP. When I putter around town doing the things I do on Saturday, my life is better if there's less congestion and I can get where I'm going faster. But that benefit doesn't show up uh, in uh, the GDP, but that doesn't make it less real. So I think I would want to frame the argument for infrastructure in terms of carefully constructed cost-benefit analysis rather than in terms of the benefits just as measured in the GDP. But Larry, I would say that just from personal observation is that I've noticed that your output of blogs on the issue of infrastructure goes up dramatically after you've had a flight that passes through JFK. So I, <laughs> there, there actually might be a case that um, the product yes. works in the other direction. But that said, Robert, do you, how would you respond to a, so Well, first, I'm glad that Larry and I can agree that fixing potholes is the most productive activity of government. <laughs> 
I mean, more generally, the question of deferred maintenance is the idea that uh, when you think about the government debt, uh, and people have often supplemented that to think about prospective payments, for example, on uh, pensions, uh, that you'd also want to include there the value of the public capital stock, which would have to be properly depreciated. And then the deferred maintenance would be part of that general framework where you'd be looking at a net position in terms of what the government owns and what it owes. Um, I can't resist saying something about what Larry said earlier about amnesty, because he really missed the obvious optimal amnesty program with respect to his library book thing. Uh, the optimal amnesty program there is you, you announce that if you bring in your illegally held books that you'll uh, not be punished and you won't have to pay any fines. But then after people bring it in, you're supposed to say, I was only kidding. <laughs> and in fact, you have to pay the full amount. And that accomplishes two things. You get the revenue, and also you uh, provide credibility that you're not going to do this again. <laughs> so it's actually the, uh, that's the optimal amnesty program. And how would that be? Robert, you're, um, you're, you're dating yourself. Uh, if memory serves, which I think it does, it was 28 years ago that you published that idea in the Wall Street Journal. Well, I, I think most people didn't notice or had forgotten. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, I don't know whether this is a more recent idea, Robert, but you recently observed, that is to say 45 minutes ago, that no great idea was ever come up with by some, somebody who was wearing a tie. So I'm actually tempted to take my tie <laughs> off to improve the quality. Yeah, of likewise. <laughs> my questions right now. But that certainly just goes to the idea that uh, anything we can do to generate more ideas is probably, you know, an unambiguously positive thing. And Nobody has come up with a formula for that, but certainly in the area of policy, you want to do things that actually sustain risk taking and idea creation rather than restrain it. And I think this is where the debate over regulation often comes in. It's not so much it's the cost benefit, oh, we have to pay more to fill out these forms. You sometimes wonder whether regulation actually discourages risk taking. I mean, if, uh, if innovation is really about yield, you know, like um, 5 only 5% of good ideas ever produce a, a good outcome. You basically want to do whatever you can to raise the denominator so that uh, you get more good ideas. But uh, you certainly hear, um, certainly I hear this all the time from business folks from in big business and small business that the, uh, the burden on, on risk taking has grown in the last six or seven years. You can see it in a lot of areas, but perhaps nowhere more profoundly in the financial area where, uh, to go to your point, um, our fear of another macroeconomic disaster seems to have put a very high premium on avoiding the, any sort of risk taking that could lead to another. Is that a problem? Can that be part of the, the explanation that's going on here? And wait a minute, I can we do something to fix wait, that? I think, we need to, I think we need to sort out two different things. I don't know whether there's a problem of unicorns or not. There's certainly a lot of people who think there are. But, you know, every, every, every fifth Harvard student who comes out of my uh, comes into my office has some kind of idea to start a startup of uh, some kind. You look out at what's happening in the financial technology sector and there are literally thousands of firms trying to innovate in one source or other of uh, financing. So the idea that the defining feature, of defining that an importantly defining problem of uh, the American economy is that people can't start companies based on new ideas. Um, seems to me to be at the edge of absurd. I mean, I said uh, 15 years ago that a great strength of the United States was that it was the only country in the world where you could uh, raise your first $100 million before you bought your first suit. And it seems to me that that is more true today uh, than, than it was when I said it 15 years ago. And I de detect no evidence that uh, that has been crushed by regulation. If anything, I think that uh, there's a real question of whether some of what holds itself out as technological innovation is actually a kind of regulatory arbitrage that because we're doing things in the Silicon Valley way, we're not covered by the traditional laws and the advantage comes more from the regulatory arbitrage than it does from the uh, than it does from the technological uh, innovation. 
I think there's a different question about what the inhibitions are or aren't on big banks contemplating big syndicated loans and uh, the like. But it seems to me that in terms of entrepreneurial, fundamental technological innovation, um, I find the argument that that's being uh, crushed uh, by regulation uh, to, be a ver uh, to be a very difficult one to see any evidence for. Yeah, in terms of incentives for risk-taking type investments, I think there are two important forces that uh, come into play there. One is kind of standard uh, property rights issues, uh, which has, brings in uh, the role of patents, uh, taxes on success, those kinds of uh, standard issues. Uh, with regard to patents, there's a standard trade-off that has been understood, at least going back to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, that there's an advantage to rewarding people who come up with new ideas, but then once things are there, you want to have them freely available and accessible, so there's a kind of trade-off there. But the other force, which I think has become much more uh, uh, prominent uh, recently, has to do with scale. So the kinds of activities that uh, Larry was uh, referring to, uh, if you're successful with something like Facebook or whatever, I mean, the scale in which you can use that is so much bigger than things used to be. And that, of course, is going to go the opposite direction in terms of, uh, in terms of motivating more risk-taking activity compared with the uh, uh, inhibitions that might relate to things like regulations, taxes, the lack of patent protection. So I think you see a lot of the kinds of risk-taking activity that are prominent now because of this scale phenomenon that basically uh, uh, there's a fixed cost of figuring something out, but then you can operate in terms of almost an arbitrary scale. And that can, of course, produce great rewards. Um, well, th uh, this has been great. And um, I got lots more questions, but I'd like to bring some of you into it. So uh, um, if you can put your hand up, I'll try and uh, get to you. And for those uh, watching on the web, a reminder that if you go to SLIDO and enter the code AEI event, your question may or may not show up here. <laughs> so um, <laughs> <laughs> there's an incentive. OK, uh, I'll start with you, sir. And uh, state your name and your affiliation. Hi, I'm Doug Carr with Carr Capital. Uh, Dr. Summers, you talked about the importance of investment for both stimulating growth and increases in productivity. But since we went off Bretton Woods, the old model that I was taught of the accelerator multiplier, the government spends money, it stimulates investment, that's actually reversed. And there's a very strongly negative relationship between government spending and investment and that's both secular as well as cyclical. Uh, similarly, uh, government deficits are strongly negatively correlated with investment. Ultra-low interest rates strongly negatively correlated with investment. Now in the U.S., when we're ostensibly near full employment. Is there a question here? Yes, absolutely. Uh, how do you stimulate demand? It's for you. <laughs> yeah. How do you stimulate demand uh, and boost investment if all these tools for stimulating I don't think the I, I don't I wouldn't subscribe to I think a substantial part of your uh, analysis suggesting that all these things that are negatively correlated with investment I don't think has the causal significance that you uh, attach to it uh, it will be generally found that in the presence of more oncologists there is more cancer but that is not usually taken as evidence that oncologists cause uh, cancer and in the same way, it will be discovered that interest rates are lowered and budget deficits tend to be increased at times when investment is weak. But it would be a serious mistake to infer from that that lower interest rates and uh, budget deficits are necessarily causes of uh, low investment. And so I think that uh, relatively standard economics involving uh, a role for the multiplier, involving a recognition that investment is, the, is sensitive to costs of capital, um, continues to be uh, the right way to think about uh, economic policy towards investment. Uh, at other points, I would have found it highly plausible, as I did, for example, uh, in advising President Clinton in 1993 to believe that um, 
high capital costs associated with budget deficits and prospective uh, budget deficits were a significant impediment to investment, and that fiscal restraint, which reduced those costs, could contribute to lower capital costs and contribute to increased uh, investment. I think that was a plausible view in 1993 and a plausible view in many places and many times. At the current moment when the 10-year real interest rate uh, is uh, zero um, and price earnings ratios are at extraordinarily high levels, very high levels, by, not extraordinarily high levels, very high levels by historical standards, I don't find that line of thought to be particularly compelling as a way to understand fluctuations in investment going forward. Um, uh, yes, over there. Uh, Bonnie Wachtel, I'm in the investment business. To Mr. Barrow, this is to some extent a variation on this question, and that link that was uh, Mr. Summers doesn't see, I think is provided by Alan Greenspan on the subject of confidence. You mentioned Simpson Bowles, and uh, that's why I'm addressing this to you. So I think what Greenspan would say is if you look at the lack of investment, it's all in long-term assets, not the stock market, which is perceived as a short-term investment, long-term investment, and then he says, when you look at the situation with the budget deficit and projected budget deficits, which are an order of magnitude higher than they have ever been before and are really pretty scary, put those together, it's very difficult to have confidence in the future to make long-term investments. Maybe we should be flipping this argument around. If we could fix that long-term problem, it might help with productivity and growth. And I'm wondering, I know it's all politically impossible, but is part of the reason why it's politically impossible because economists don't convey the message, yes, we really have to focus on this and do it. You know, I agree with that sentiment that uncertainty about the long-term fiscal situation is probably a drag on uh, investment. So that particularly involves taxes, and on the spending side, the main thing would be entitlement programs in terms of the projection looking uh, unsustainable in terms of the current situation, that something basically has to give. And that was the whole point of the Simpson-Bowles uh, Commission, which delivered its report in 2010. And I thought they had a lot of sensible ideas. Uh, gradual kinds of changes that uh, try to cement the uh, long-term fiscal situation of the U.S. government. And uh, this went back to some packages, particularly from the 1980s, that had been put into place and it went further in some regards, uh, eliminating some deductions on the federal income tax as another example, especially whole mortgage interest. Um, it seems that every now and then the uh, government can get to a situation where it has a serious discussion of those kinds of matters and sometimes delivers results. So it hasn't been since 2010. Uh, I think that that commission report could actually have been pretty much implemented if the administration had been interested in it uh, at that point in time. So we may get back to that kind of thing. But I agree with your implicit argument that that's uh, uh, important with respect to investment and other things. I want to, we've I, stayed out. Well, just a minute. Just a minute. We've we've stayed out of politics here pretty well, but you just crossed you just crossed the line. Um, <laughs> that by, wasn't much of a line. You just no, yeah, no, it was. You just crossed the line by blaming the administration on Simpson Bowles. Let's just be clear that there were three members of the Simpson Bowles panel from the House majority. All three opposed the report. It was a non-starter in the House of Representatives that was controlled by the Republicans. The one thing that would have made it more of a non-starter would have been Barack Obama's endorsement. Barack Obama <laughs> did what made it more likely to happen, which was stay away from it and see if the process could be restarted later. So whatever you think about Simpson Bowles somehow blaming that failure on the administration when the administration's representatives supported the uh, recommendation and the House Republicans did not. I think that was unworthy of you. Um, oh. And that, I think, is not, that, that part of it. <laughs>
That part of it, I think. That part, I think of it is uh, is not is not fair. I thought I don't the think Democrats were in charge of Congress at that time. I don't uh, understand this argument. No, they no, they weren't. No, they, they weren't. It came it came after the twenty it came after the twenty ten election. So, um, staying on non controversial subjects, I'm going to ask. <laughs> a, uh, we have a, a question about corporate tax reform uh, from uh, from the online audience, which I think is pretty important because once again. Uh, thinking about the next president's term, it does seem to be one area of uh, common ground uh, between Democrats and Republicans, although getting there is obviously the challenge. So the question is, um, how much growth will come from tax reform uh, itself uh, versus just res resolving the uncertainty that surrounds the corporate tax system? I think both matter. I think the, the uncertainty, there's a certain tendency to just like until I know what the rules are I'm not going to make my investment plan so I think bringing clarity to the subject would uh, make a positive contribution particularly on the aspect that I referred to in terms of the return of uh, foreign capital obviously bringing better clarity to it um, will produce results that are better with a better package than with a less good package I think there is I'm going to say something I think is very important in thinking about what may happen over the next nine months. I think there is a rather, um, I am for, as I made very clear, both infrastructure investment and corporate tax reform. And there are many people who are saying that those two things should be twinned because they're both good and Democrats like infrastructure and Republicans like uh, corporate tax reform and business likes uh, corporate tax reform and corporate tax reform will pay for infrastructure. There is a, there are some laws of arithmetic that are constraining here, which is the kinds of corporate tax reform that businesses like tend to be corporate tax reforms that mean that business pays less. <laughs> just, just kind of the way the world is. And tax reforms where business pays less are likely to be tax reforms that need to be paid for rather than tax reforms that pay for other things. And so the idea that you can do a tax reform which both, in a genuine sense, improves the government's budget position and provides money to pay for a new spending priority and makes business better off, there is a real arithmetic uh, problem there that is underappreciated by many of the tribunes of bipartisan uh, agreements. And people tend to want to square the circle with a kind of budget trick um, which is we'll only count the revenue in the short run and we'll do something where business pays more in in the short run but gets promised long run benefits whose impact on the government budget we won't take account of in our calculations. That's one way of, uh, that's one way of squaring uh, things. But I think it will be somewhat more difficult to both genuinely pay for infrastructure and give business what it's hoping for in terms of a reduction in the amount they pay than a fair amount of the commentary uh, suggests. Yeah, I mean, in terms of Simpson Bowles in particular, I think a central idea was that we were already in trouble with entitlement spending in terms of the projections. And then we're trying to do things with revenue that are uh, in that context. So it's not particularly providing uh, additional monies for other kinds of programs, which Larry, I think, was indicating would have been uh, problematic. But in terms of uncertainty versus uh, kind of the overall package and rates, uh, they clearly came together in that kind of context. And I'm not sure how to say how much of importance is one piece versus the other, but. I think it was an attempt to make the overall package sort of uh, sustaining over a long period in terms of squaring entitlement spending with revenues. But at the same time, I think it was trying to make the uh, tax rates more favorable for things like investment, including things on the corporate side, and also 
things on the individual income tax in terms of eliminating deductions that most people think are unproductive. Uh, so with some of all, there was of all a lot. That, there was a lot that I think was good uh, in uh, in in Simpson Bowles, particularly on the particularly on the tax reform side. But I do want to come back to this. This uncertainty idea is appealing, but the kind of thing I was saying a little while ago does apply. Look, um, new buildings are pretty good substitutes for old buildings. You know, a new office building competes with an old office building. And so if the environment is somehow such that it's discouraging the creation of new office buildings, the environment, you would, this, that same environment by the same logic should be reducing the value of old office buildings. And if you look at commercial real estate prices now, people are discussing whether they're a bubble. I have no idea whether they are a bubble or are not. But commercial real estate prices are not depressed. The Greenspan theory that we're not having investment in real estate uh, and structures because of all the uncertainty has a pretty clear testable implication, namely that the structures that uh, substitute for new investment, existing structures, should be declining in value or should have seen their value go down or should have their value depressed, or you should be able to see some impact of all of this uncertainty in the value of existing structures. And all you have to do is look at REIT prices to test that idea, and uh, the data go very much uh, in uh, the opposite direction. So I think if you want to make that argument, you at least need some explanation for what's happened uh, to the price of existing assets. So do you have a story um, about why elevated commercial real estate prices would go along with weak private investment? Yeah, I think, if, I, I think that uh, there are a set of issues around uh, regulation and zone, uh, zoning, rules on land, rules on land use, difficulty in permitting that would operate in exactly that direction. It would make it harder to build uh, new structures and that would tend to raise the value of existing structures. I think that line of thought is a much more plausible one than the one that emphasizes some new generalized uncertainty. So I think we have time for like one more question. Uh, yes, you're at the very back. Greetings, I'm Thomas Ward. Um, first, I want to state that last week there was two great programs here at um, AEI, one on innovation, what plays all into the growth aspect, and then one on infrastructure that I'd recommend everyone to look at. But my big question is, is goes back to the issue of underlining growth. How do we get growth when we got a couple issues going on? One, we got third quarter growth that just came out at 2.9%, I think it is. Um, overall, we may not have you know one percent. Time is short, so yep. let's get to the question quickly. But two things would come into play. One, we got to look at back in 2013 in August. Question: It changed down three percent the price. So is the growth really that number? But also in depression of the pricing, if we have these taxes and everything else taking money out, how do we ever get growth if we're only going to be looking at taking money out of the economy instead of trying to get it into the economy? Will higher taxes hurt the long-term growth, growth outlook? You know, I'm general, I'm sympathetic to the idea that uh, marginal tax rates applying to individuals or uh, businesses matter for things like investment and economic growth. So I'm more sympathetic to the idea that the kinds of tax cuts that particularly were in place in the 1980s actually worked and did encourage economic growth. Uh, um, that's not to say that that's all that matters, and you certainly had growth in the 1990s without having those kinds of uh, cuts in, in tax rates. But I think it's certainly a part of the picture if you're thinking about growth and investment. Look, you're going to have a little bit of a tough time here because you're basically making Robert's, you're basically reaching Robert's kind of conclusion with my kind of argument. Because Sounds you're perfect. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're, you're basically making an argument in Keynesian terms about the impact of, uh, of tax increases. 
I don't think the imperative right now should be, I think the imperative should be raising the growth rate. I do not think that fiscal restraint is plausibly a major growth promotion strategy at a moment when interest rates are effectively zero. And uh, it was reasonable to think of fiscal restraint as a central growth strategy in uh, 1993 when capital costs were high and plausibly were what was holding back investment. I think you can, I think there's a very good debate to be had about the respective role of public investment and reduction of barriers to uh, private investment. I think that obviously one has to pay attention to long run fiscal sustainability, but I would tell you that I think if we are successful as a country in raising the growth rate to anything like 3%, there will be a strong tendency for these fiscal problems to melt away as the economy grows out of them, um, almost regardless of what we do in terms of fiscal packages. And if we are not successful and the underlying growth rate of the economy remains in the one, one and a half to two percent range, I think we're likely to be preoccupied with questions of long run fiscal health almost no matter what fiscal packages um, we are able to adopt. And so I think, the, for, I think there's a need in Washington, which I think is substantially happening, for the frame of big picture economic debate, which has been about, has been for 15 or 20 years, in, framed in terms of long-term budget plans to be reframed in terms of growth acceleration. And I think that reframing from the long run budget issues to uh, the question of growth ought to be something that people can agree on whether they come at it from a more progressive and Keynesian perspective or from a more conservative and incentive oriented perspective. Um, well, thanks. Uh, we as a country, uh, and I personally, tend to obsess way too much over the short term and never more so than four days before a presidential election. So I am very grateful to both of you for this wonderful interlude where we actually thought a lot about the long term. So thank you both, Robert and Larry, and thank you. Thank you.